All right, you guys ready to get started? I'm going to ask our panel to come up. We started last week, and we, we, had, uh, we had Brady, Brother Gilbert Cervantes, Christy Rivera, and yeah, come on, let's hear it for these guys. And we also had Zach Gadbury. Today, today Zach had an unfortunate uh, little, little incident where he had his heater went out completely. He's having to, to work on that. He just called me. I told him, man, that's okay. We got this. We've got four other individuals. Pastor Melissa was sick last week. This week, she's, she's back, back at it. So she's going to be up here in a second. Now, I just want to catch us up from where we've been. How many of us enjoyed last week? You know, and last week we dealt with the men. And, and, and I told our panel, I said, hey, I don't want you to coddle the guys. I don't want you to... Put it on the ladies. I don't want you, I want you to let the guys know what God's word says. Come on, men. How many of us have seen a deterioration of manhood in our country? And it's because nobody wants to just speak truth. I'm not talking about beating up guys for the sake of beating them up. But I'm also talking about being truthful and saying, hey, this is what we're called to be. Not everybody gets a trophy, right? Not everybody gets to that a boy. Sometimes you got to get a, 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 hey, come on, let's go. Let's get after it. So we dealt with the guys. And this week, I had a particular brother say, are we dealing with the girls this week? And I said, yeah. He goes, good, because Laura needs it. <laughs> so <laughs> she knew exactly who, was it, who it was. It, it was Josh over here, and he just got a slap. But hey, I set you up, buddy. Right there. No, I'm just kidding. Listen, today we're going to deal with the ladies, but I want to start off reminding us where we've been, okay? And then I'll let the panel loose. The first thing is, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. As a matter of fact, we find this in the book of John, chapter 10, 10. I'd love for you to mem memorize this verse, because it really does give you perspective on what's, tr what's happening the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy your marriage, your family, your children, your relationship, you as a man, your, your, your wife as a, as, a, as a woman of God, and as a, as a mother. So the Bible says the thief comes, does not come except. The only thing he wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, said Jesus, that you might have life and that you might have it in abundance or in fullness. Meaning he doesn't want you to be empty. He wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to experience the fullness that he has. And so we're gonna focus on real togetherness. Not a cheap worldly togetherness, but a godly togetherness that brings this fullness. And so we're gonna talk about you as a man or woman of God. We talked about the man of God. We talked about the woman of God some. We talked about the husband and the father. Today, we're going to focus on the wife and the mother. From these, from these uh, you, you can see it there from the slide. Now, in order to be a woman or a man of God, I'm setting the foundation right here. We need to understand what Jesus meant when he said, you must seek first the kingdom. Guys, I need you to get this because it surprises me how many people spend years in church and never get the fundamental. The fundamental message of Jesus was, look, you've got two worlds. You've got a heavenly kingdom and you have an earthly kingdom. The heavenly kingdom, I'm the king. So Jesus said, I'm the king. The earthly kingdom is who? The other guy. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I come to give you life. You get a choice. That's the way it works. You get a choice. Now watch this. If you seek the kingdom of God above everything else and live righteously, then what? I will give you everything you need in the process. Or you can do it his way and see how far it gets you. And so that really is the whole fundamental truth of, of, of what we, how you got to start. You've got to start with a determination that, you know what, Lord, I'm going to do it your way. So we said in order to be a man or a woman of God, you've got to experience salvation. 
That means you got to get to a point where you say, Lord, I'm tired of doing it my way. I let down, I lay down my life and I take up your way. From here on out, it's you telling me what to do. I'm not going to question you. Come on. How many of us are trying to be Christians, but we question God at every corner? We question God, but why? But why do I have to do, why does this have to happen? Why is the Bible real? Why is this not? Sometimes you just have to just determine and say, you know what? The Bible is real. I believe it, and that settles it. Today, one of our great legends of the faith passed away. What you may not know is when he first started, he was, he went on, on evangelism crusade with another gentleman. This other gentleman was primary to him or, or was more popular and by all intents and purposes was probably a more gifted communicator. But this other gentleman began to have struggles with his faith. As he had struggles with his faith, he just kept questioning and questioning and questioning, which only fueled this, this selfish type of worldly mentality. At some point, it totally took him away from the faith. But before he left the faith, he really tried to bring Billy Graham down and really tried to sow those seeds of doubt. And one day, Billy Graham says, I can remember like it was yesterday, I knelt down in my hotel room and I made a vow to God, Lord, I receive you and every bit of your word by faith, and that settles it right here, right now. You are God and you take full control. That happened the week before the Los Angeles revival that literally changed his entire life. How many of us know if you want God's blessing, sometimes you have to just say, Lord, Know God's character, seek first the kingdom, cornerstones, pray, Bible read, meditation, fasting, and then accept his authority. We said, guys, we're head, head of the household, but Christ is who we represent. Meaning Christ was the head, but he was always serving. He lays down his life. So you're under his authority first. You're a servant leader, you're a priest, you're a prophet, you're a protector, you're a provider. That's what we talked about last week. Today, we're gonna talk about the woman of God, the wife and a mother, all right? So let's start off with wife. Equal but different. Guys, what does it mean to be equal but different? The mic. We have another mic right here as well, so if y'all wanna share them, just spread them out. Well, we know right off the bat that we're equal. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> that I, was, so I was asked if uh, uh, I was at HEB checking out and I was wearing this. And like, oh, did your wife buy that for you? No. Cash. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And that was Rachel who asked him that. Rachel Webb. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Where is Rachel? She's around here. So. so Okay, let's, let's get back to our question. Equal but different. What does it mean, equal but different? Christy, you were going to share something? Well, we're equal in being, so God Amen. created us to be equal, but we're not equal in what I call function or in our roles. So as a function, a wife is, was made subject to her husband. So when you understand the authority, we're equal in being, but before God, we're not equal in function. If That's that really sense. good. Can, can everyone kind of agree with that and understand that, hey, we're, we're equal before God when it comes to salvation, when it comes to his love for us, when it comes to all of those things. I think this is what Paul meant when he said, at the foot of the cross, what? There is neither slave nor free. What? Gentile or Greek. So your economic status doesn't matter to God. Your racial or heritage doesn't matter to God. Your gender doesn't matter to God. You can be male or female, and, and, and he's going to treat you and love you the same. But that doesn't mean he has the same function for everybody. I mean, we know that because he calls some to be leaders. He, call, he raises up presidents, and he raises up kings, and he raises up governors. And 
Not everyone is the same in every way. Well, he also does that. Is that, is that what you're saying in the, in the home? Okay, so today we're going to talk about that difference. I think we should start in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, the Bible says that God created human beings. You see this in your notes and you see it up here. Then the Lord, I'm just going to read it. Then the Lord formed the man. Well, I'm in the wrong verse I'm going to read 26 and 27 Cody I may have these out of order then God said let us make human beings in our image to be like us they will reign over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky the livestock all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground so God created human beings in his own image in the image God created them male and female he created them so he we both have the image of God. That, that, that points to that equalness. But watch the difference as we get into chapter 2. Brady, can you continue to be our reader? Sure. Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. All right. So I want you to consider he formed man from clay. Let's keep going. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Wow. This is some deep stuff, but let's just unpack it for a second. Guys, what jumps out at you that's important for us to understand this idea that God made us equal but different? Well, the difference is the beauty. The beauty. <laughs> hey, I, mean, I like what because, Gil comes uh, right after it. When Adam saw her, I mean, it just really just, whoa, whoa man. <laughs> whoa, man. Okay, and, I like that. And I think that sometimes we forget that God made women uh, in their beauty, and that's the attraction that we have Amen. to women. And not only that, but I think you know, they're so different in the way that we, how we should treat them. So I, I want to I unpack that a little bit more because I think it's obvious to see the difference in the physical. You know, we can go into all sorts of differences. Men have more blood in their system than women do. Women typically have a higher percentage of their body weight in fat than men do. Men have more muscle. Men have a, 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 a more dense bone frame. They have a thicker skull. So, yeah, yeah, ladies, ladies. Elaborate on that. <laughs> I'll just leave that right there. Um, you have these differences between the two, and it shows up in appearance. Okay? Women are beautiful. Men are not so much. And so, but, but what else jumps off the page at you guys? Uh, uh, Christy brought this up last night, but it's very, it's very impressive that, you know, the Lord, God, the Lord God in his perfection doesn't make mistakes, so the plan was always the plan, right? <clears throat> so he creates the man from the dust of the ground, breathed life in, into his nostrils, and the man became a living person. But then he says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So he created man alone with the intention of bringing along a helpmate. That's so good. You know, and we look at where he brought him from. You know, the word there says that he came from the rib. But... I just took the liberty to find out what that word meant a little bit. And it's, I think the Hebrew word is Tesla. I remember that because it's not a car or something. But Tesla is the Hebrew word. And it actually means side chamber. And I believe it was like a prophetic statement as saying that from the side of man I will bring you. You will walk alongside him. And so that this helper that I bring to you is actually a really powerful word. The word there, I like to look up words, what they mean, right? It's a word, azer, and I think you have it here, Pastor, right? It says mm -hmm. easy E-R, right? This word, azer. And it is not a word that we should look at negatively. You know, he, he calls us a helper. 
And this word is a word that describes someone of great strength and support. The word help means to come alongside, to provide aid for that person. And when we come alongside of our husbands, of our man, we are looked at as a powerful and influential companion. Do you know that that same word is found in Psalm 33, 20, Psalm 75, and Psalm 159, and it speaks of our God, it speaks of God himself, that same word, azer, that he calls us as his helper, not that we're equal to God, but just saying, it's not a word that we should look at um, negatively, diminish that word, and it, he calls us a helper. We, hear, we know that there's another word that the New Testament uses as a helper. What's, who's the helper? In the Holy New Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And that Amen. Holy Spirit is somebody who's going, he says he teaches us, he counsels us, he's an intercessor. And so women were called to intercede for our husbands on their behalf, we're to remind them of the truth. When they think one thing, we're to say, no, 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 this is what God says about you. This is what the word of God has to say about the situation. So I think it's a powerful word as a helper. We're not to look at it negatively. Amen. But, but a, Amen. a great a word of great strength. I, I totally, I totally agree with that. I mean, if you think about it, to be a help, and, and literally a better, a better translation, we use the word helper because we don't use the old King James, but the King James is a help meet, to help meet the needs of our, but those two words are, are brought from the Hebrew, which is, uh, which is where we get the word Ebenezer, Ezer is the is the helper but even more specifically I, I like what christy said but it also means savior so that's a big connotation for i want to say that but i'm glad you said that you know i, I wanted to say that because it kind of sounds like they're tooting their own horn but that's what the bible says you know if you look at the notes i put there for you it's it it means to rescue to save another meaning could mean to be strong that noun occurs 21 times in the Hebrew Bible. And eight of these instances, the word means savior. Eight is a significant number. Eight is a very significant number. So, so I think the, the Lord is trying to, but it also is combined. Help meet is combined with the other word, which is where we get the kignedgo. And, and the word is naked, which not naked. I, I don't want you to think, I, I, did the brother just said naked? No, naked is related and it means, it, it's related to the word against. Now, if you're not careful, you might say, well, she is a helper that is against me? Dude, that makes sense. You know, guys are, but, but I, and I want to teach the guys here for just a second how to appreciate your wives. It literally means also not just against, but in front or opposite. It's as if you're looking in a mirror that's in front of you. She's everything you're not. And she's meant to be your helper. She's meant to be, you know, for lack of a, you know, the Jerry Maguire thing, you complete me. <laughs> you know, she's meant to complete you. Amen. Um, but, but I want to get into a little bit deeper because I'm going to let these guys go in just a second. What does it mean to leave your father and mother? And notice verse 24. Who is God talking to? The man. Okay. Ladies, what does that mean for a man to leave his household? Well, I think it definitely means that, you know, you're, you're leaving your family. So you're going to become the priest of your own household, meaning you need to lead the way. You need to set the tone, the godly tone that you want to instill in your household. And you're going to be the leader who should lead by example. Um, and so that means really forgetting the ways of, that you did uh, or you, the traditions you may have had or the ways you did it and really creating a new way that's going to be unique to your wife and yourself, but always remembering to keep God first and seek him first in everything that you do. Amen. Anything else? You talked about it last night about we completed, it's like a triangle, you know, man and woman and then God. Amen. And if God's not the center, then uh, the relationship doesn't really grow. And a lot of marriages start out that way. Our, mine, ours didn't, same way. You know, we didn't really know 
Christ the way we did. My wife said something today. That we were talking about Billy Graham. She said she remembered when she was 12 and 13. She heard him on TV. She said, you know, if I was there, I think I would have gotten up and accepted the Lord. And it wasn't until years later when we got married that she accepted him. And then our, our marriage grew stronger because Amen. of that. No, it, it is definitely about the Lord. Brady? Uh, so the Valentine's Day messages, there's always a series around Valentine's Day, and Pastor used to finish and bring out a hoopah, and I always called it the Supa Dupa Hoopa message. But part of it, and what I remember distinctly about that message, is uh, the first year that I had heard it, uh, you had talked about the hoopah and the semblance, you know, what it, re what it was to represent, you know, and there, but you said specifically in that first time that there's only room for the husband, the wife, and God. There's no room, and you went down the list. I don't know if y'all were dealing with something. There's no room for Yoli. There's no room. I don't know. I'm just kidding. For Louis. But, say it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Come on, Bree. Point is, is that it was, it, it's good to have a visual represent, representation of what the, what the language in the Bible means. You know, uh, you know uh, Hebrews, the Jews used to get married, and the husband will go prepare his own home. Amen. Right? He wouldn't go back to mom and dad's. He would prepare his own home. There's, all, there's so much symbolism around wedding language in the Bible, and that's part of it. But you, you, you did a good job. Amen. I, I want to I kind of just jump on this real quick, and then we'll move on. But this is a very important verse when he says, they will leave and cleave. He starts with the man first. All, the man always goes first. So, ladies, if your man has left his home, he's left being a mama's boy, He's left. Come on now. Can I get an amen? Oh, I saw you gotta, some mama's voice smiling out there. <laughs> you got to leave mama's home. That means mama no longer gets to tell you what to do. There's a new mama. Can I say that? There's a new mama. So if, if, if your husband has left, then now, listen, ladies, this is when it comes to you. You have to cleave to him. You have to trust him enough to say, Baby, you're my leader now. Yeah. Not, well, daddy used to do it. Well, mama used to do it this way. And I think I'm going to go back. No, 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 no. You guys have to work it out. I'll never forget the best thing my dad, my, my father-in-law did. My, I have a godly father-in-law. That's why he's an elder here at this church. He, absolutely. He, my, my wife called back. He said, you're married. Deal with your husband. Click. How many of you know that's the best thing you can do? Because that's what this verse is about. Yeah. Let, let, let's keep going. I, I, we'll talk more of the naked and unashamed in a later passage. But, but I want to talk, talk about the fall and how the fall messed some things up. Now there's a verse after the fall that says, and I didn't put it in our notes, but if you want to put it, I'll... You can take, jot it down. It's right up here. It's in Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3.16 says the Lord says, he's, he's pronouncing what's just taken place because of the disobedience that took place between Adam and Eve. They ate from the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and so they have fallen now. They have fallen. Uh, one important thing you guys need to remember is before, this goes back to they were naked and unashamed. The reason they were unashamed is because they were clothed in God's authority, his righteousness, and his light. Literally, God was their clothing. The moment they fall, they realize their nakedness. They are now ashamed because the knowledge of your sin brings shame, conviction, guilt. The first question God asked them when he found them, he said, who told you? And then he pronounces the consequences. To the woman, he says, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy. Now, we've tried to overcome that with epidurals, but... And in pain, you will bring forth the birth, all right, or give birth. Now, watch this. And you will desire to control your husband. Now, some versions have tried to soften that. They say your desire will be for your husband. No, that's not what it means. It means you will desire to control him and he will what? 
rule over you. And there has been this conflict between husband and wife ever since. And if you're not careful, you will experience this conflict to your own demise. To your own demise. And that's what we're going to talk about here right now. Anybody want to share anything about that verse? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, I, I just think that this is something that we need to take back uh, as Christians and having a healthy Christian marriage because I think in, you know, what Pastor's talking about here is a, a real revelation and, and lots of times the feminist movement is really taking this and it's exploiting it and it's, and it's a lie from the pit of hell. And you can see how even from the very beginning, the enemy is trying to use it. I feel like a lot of times in our Christian marriages, we don't look at one another as trying to complete one another or being partners or team members, we really compete with one another. Mm. And the enemy tries to make us feel women specifically, and this is what this verse is warning us against here, is that we want to, com you know, like, we never want our husbands to take advantage of us. We never want our husbands to rule over us or, or to try to speak down to us. And, you know, lots of times it's because we had a strong, you know, family where the women made a lot of decisions. Lots of times it's because past hurt. But really, that's not how God ever created us. He created us for us to have a mutual love, a mutual respect for one another. And to not be competing with one another, but really working together in unity. I guarantee you, if you look at your spouse right now, the things that we are, that we as women are strong in probably is not the same thing that our husband is strong in and vice versa. And that's why we're talking about how God uniquely created us so that we would really, truly complete one another and we would bring the best out. So whatever I'm not seeing, Chris has, can see my blind spots and same thing with me. And so remember this, because if we don't have an understanding of this, ladies, that our husbands are not, you know, going to hurt us. They're not trying to be the bad guy. We don't have to fight against them. We need to stand back to back and fight the enemy and his lies that are coming up against us. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Uh, Pastor, it says that in uh, Genesis 3, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree, uh, the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Mm -hmm. At no time did he say, hey, honey, what are you doing? He never intervened. He never stopped her. He's responsible. We're responsible. It wasn't so much her fault. Absolutely. Because he didn't say anything. And when you're not under, God, under God's shelter, under his protection, under his spirit, you know, you don't know what to say. You don't know what to say. And, and, and I think that a lot of times men are a little bit leery because they don't understand, and I didn't either, that I need to start reading God's Word. And, and He helps me uh, share with my wife. Uh, helps you be the leader you're called to be. Exactly. Absolutely. We're talking about the what, the how, and the why. And really, we've just covered a lot of the what. We're about to head into the New Testament, guys, because the New Testament talks about these role differences, these differences in our roles. Now, I want you to think about when God pronounced that curse. He said, he said, you will, you will bring children in pain. You will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you because this is what happens in a bad relationship. The woman tries to usurp his power. And he either gives in and it's out of order, or he fights back. And honestly, for literally hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, men and women had this whole thing mixed up. Who came to set it straight? Who came to set it straight? Jesus did. Jesus came to set it straight. And I wish I could go through all of Jesus' teachings and how he impacted uh, the dynamic between men and women. He raised women higher than any leader had ever even thought about it. Some would say he was a feminist. No, he wasn't. He was God saying, this is how I intended it to be. Yeah. You guys are equal, but you have different roles. You have different roles. And so we see these roles really beginning to take shape in the New Testament. Christy, would you read? Uh, it's, in the, it's in the handout. And, and the reason I say that, you, you brought this passage up last night when we, when we did our, our debrief. And it's 1 Peter. 
Yes, it says 1 Peter 3, 4 through 6. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called her master, called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Can, can you reread um, <laughs> verse 6? Yes, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. Her, her, her master. <laughs> I love her master. Her master or Lord. Other versions say Yeah, Lord. another version says hey, Lord. Lord. Uh, amen. Can, can we just... I need someone to put that up on the wall. And, no, I'm just kidding. No, but... But guys, the reason we came right at it, right from the New Testament, is because these are the kind of passages that make us cringe and go, well, God couldn't have meant that. What do you think God meant, guys? I mean, he put it in his word. These aren't our words. This is in the word of God from Peter, one of Jesus' trusted disciples. I want to hear from Christy. You explained this beautifully, how this verse... Uh, brought truth to your life? Oh, well, it did. You know, I was one that was out of order, so I can only speak from someone that was out of order. <laughs> and, 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 but when I became to get in right standing, or we you know we, righteousness with the Lord, he showed me these. And I wasn't afraid to look at these passages anymore because I really wanted to always be in righteousness, be in right standing with God. So when I got this, it brings, it brings such peace and revelation. But I love what it says because Sarah not only just obeyed her husband and called him her master, that out of her mouth, she showed respect and honor from him. It wasn't lip service. It wasn't just um, something she did because she had to. You know, like I said, and sometimes our kids, you might say, well, sit down. And he doesn't want to sit down. Sit down. And they don't want to sit down. Well, they may finally sit down, but inside they're like, I'm sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up. You know, it's that kind of disobedient spirit, and we can't have that disobedient. I think the obedient spirit is something that the Lord looks at. And we know um, that, you know, that the word of God speaks so highly about obedience. And I think this is something that we can find peace in. We can find freedom in our relationship with Christ and in our relationship with our spouses when we obey. Amen. Anything else? Obey. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really good, um, Christy. I love the fact, you know, that that Sarah called him that. But we also have to remember, I mean, she was married to Abraham. And that was... I mean, he was a friend of God, and he, and you, when you think about, well, it, it doesn't lessen it. He's going, yeah, amen. <laughs> it, it doesn't lessen it, but we do, know, we do know, right, that Abraham was an amazing man, that he had faith, that he followed the Lord, and when everyone else on, in, on the face of the earth was disobedient, it was Abraham who was faithful. And so I think, number one, we can take away that when you are following after the Lord, and if you love the Lord like Abraham did, and you have that faith, it's going to be much easier for your wife to follow you than if you're a man who is in disobedience and not putting God first. So that's number one, I would say. Number two would be she clothed herself. And ladies, this is for us too, because we spend lots of time trying to look attractive, trying to look the best. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. I'm going to try always to look the best that I possibly can for my husband. I'm not comparing myself to somebody else, but I'm going to be the best version of myself that I can be. But just as much time as I spend on the external and that you may be spending on the external, we need to make sure we're spending just as much time on the internal looking for those qualities to be the type of wife those good qualities being submissive being a wife that is trying and striving to be her husband's helpmate so we need to be within our hearts having that obedient spirit that spirit that says I'm okay with submitting to my husband because girlfriends we can look just as good as we want to and we can act like we're holy and when we get home I'm like mm, you're not gonna tell me what to do well don't try to come and act like you're this super Christian woman and then you know when you go home that you're disobedient because that's not being the child of God that Christ is calling us as women to be now, I'd, I'd like to say something as well because she made a, b a good point that Abraham was a man of God. The dude was commended in all of scripture for being a friend of God and trusting the Lord with true faith. But can I just share something with you? That at the end of the day, Sarah had to trust him. 
She did. Because when God came and said, I'm moving you. I'm moving for you from all your comfort zone. I'm moving you from all your family. I'm moving you from all of this that you have held so dear. And I'm moving you to a far off land. I guarantee you, Sarah had a crisis of faith. She had a point in that relationship where she either had to trust her husband or fight him. Come on, how many of us have ever been there? See, because at the end of the day, the husband is the leader. And I, I'm going to share my own testimony later about how Melissa and I had to really work at this. Because I, was, I always got that. I'm the leader. I'm, I'm Mexican. I get that easy. You know, that's an easy concept to, for, a, for a macho guy to get. You know, I'm the leader. You know, what I didn't get is what it meant to be a servant leader. And we'll talk more about that later. But we're, but, we're not off the hook yet. No. So obeyed and called him Lord. But if you keep going right behind what was just read, husbands, likewise, dwell with them, your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. That's a reference to marriage. That your prayers may not be hindered. Don't be rough with your wife and expect to have answered prayers. That's not what I said. That's what God said. Mm. Mm. This is an interesting thing. I'll, I'll let get Gil go right after this. This is an interesting thing because what God is saying is this. And, and if you read out of, uh, out of the Corinthian passage that I have, Cody, if you can put it up there. In Corinthians, he literally says, watch this. Christ is the head of the church. The man is what? the head of the woman, and the head of Christ is God. So everything he does is by authority, remember? But this is the way authority works. Authority works by respecting it and submitting to it. That means when you respect it, the authority that's been conveyed to you, you don't mistreat it. Because nothing gets God more upset than someone who is mistreating those under him. Remember, David was about to be killed by the Lord for mistreating Uriah. Now, this is what the Bible says in the passage that Brady just read. If you are harsh with your wife, then God is going to have something to say to you, men. But this isn't about the men today. It's about the ladies. So I'm going to keep it real. Because some of my guys always say, you never concentrate on the girls. And girls, I'm just going to be honest. If you're rebellious, if you always have something smart to say, if you're constantly pushing and bucking your husbands and jabbing at them and making it miserable, it's going to be very tough to lead. It is. It's kind of like it's really tough, regardless of what you think of our president, if everyone is always, and it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter if it was the last president that they constantly threw mud at, this president that they constantly, because that's the world's way. God says, whether you agree or not, respect the authority. And that's what's lacking in America today. There's no respect anymore. And it's showing up in the home. And so. Uh, Pastor, that first uh, verses that, in chapter 3 of what Christy was reading, we, it said, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words. Read, read that again. This is powerful. Someone write this down. If you have a husband who is not believing. First, first Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Uh, wives in the same way submit yourselves to your husbands. So that if any of them do not believe the word. They may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. I think a lot of times there's a relationship that. Or there's only one. Maybe the wife is a believer. And she's trying so hard to get her husband to come to know the Lord. I think there's, and you know, and I'm not looking, I can glance. There's, there's a wall right here between a lot of couples right now. And, and that is maybe there, there's not that close relationship because of uh, their relationship with Christ. And, and when the Holy Spirit of the Lord comes in the household, they start getting closer and closer. Mm. And, and I remember, it, you know, Put, just, hold that mic. just the other night when Mary and I, when I'd get mad, she somehow I'd have to apologize and I just would say under the covers, I'm sorry, 
See, what'd you say? I said, I said, oh, sorry. And I was mumbling and mumbling it. And then finally, I just... Because, because what did you say? Tell the part. Like, when y'all had the disagreement, did she say anything oh, to no, you in no, the moment? Oh, yeah. That's I important, mean, I mean, you think. know, when the girls were at home back then, and I'd be upset about something. It was just words. I'd be so upset about it, and man, I know I could see tears coming out of her eyes. She didn't say a word till the next day. She called me. She said, you know, what you said really hurt me and it, it embarrassed the kids. And I just felt so little. But she didn't I, say I it want in you to mean take tone. a note. She didn't confront him in the moment when he was upset. at his highest state. She waited. And she did it the next day. You know, it's a real fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And the closer you grow in relationship with the Holy Spirit, that, that's just a byproduct. That's a fruit in self-control. And I had such a, you know, the, it says in the Word of God that we older women are to teach. I got to see that firsthand because I was kind of a lot like the, my dad. So I would be like, oh, I, oh, I know you did not just talk to her like that. I'd wait to watch my mom like, what are you going to say, mom? Like, this is going to be good. This could be good. <laughs> she would never, never once did I see my mother um, say anything till the next day when my dad would come home with flowers or dinner or whatever good, but he would, it would take him 24 hours and I'd watch my mother then calmly say, that, yes, fairly spoken word for example. And Amen. it's a wonderful example. I think that we as older women too can be that kind of example to our disciple makers and, and to teach them what I got to see growing up. Can you read the verse one more time? Yes, it says, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your hu own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So without words by, by our behavior. And like, I really thought about that as we talked the other night because I, I counsel so many women and that's, the, that's what they ask. Like, well, what do I do? Because I'm trying to live right for the Lord, but my husband, he just doesn't want to come. He doesn't want to believe. And you know, he's not following after the Lord. And how, what words do you have to say to a woman who feels like she's really striving, but the husband's just not getting, he's not at the same place she is. And I would, I mean, that mm. verse, I really went home and I thought about that because it says without words by her actions. And I think too many times we're wanting God to move in our spouse, but we're it literally in the way because every time we go home and we're like, well, you know, you should have been there. Or, you know, pastor said this today and he said this, and that would have spoken to you. Or you're trying to play worship music or you're trying to put pastor's message on so he can hear it. No you wonder are, they hate me before they walk in. <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing is you're saying, really, God, I've got this. And really, the, the, when we close our mouths and we lead with, in actions of love, like Gil was talking, Mary was doing, that we move out of the way and we allow the Holy Spirit to then begin to work. And he can supernaturally change things without us saying a word. So if we're wondering where our miracle is, we may need to think, I may be keeping the miracle from happening by my words and by actions. I need to stop, close my mouth, and trust in the Lord. And in his time, that miracle is going to happen. And the good thing is when God works, it's total transformation. It's just not a funny, oh, I feel good in this moment. It's lasting. Can I share something? I, I, this is a place I'm going to share my testimony. This is a tough thing. And I always, often thought, Lord, you did a cruel, cruel joke on us. <laughs> Because you put me in charge, and then you ask Melissa to trust me. But if we're not working together like that luge team, or like that bobsledding team, or like any of those teams that you see on the, then it all starts falling apart. And so, you know, she wouldn't trust me, and then I'd get more upset. And the minute she stopped trusting me and she'd start nagging, we'll talk more about that later, but she, I'd view it as nagging. And, and there's something about men you got to understand, ladies. I'm just going to let you in on it. The moment you start doing this to them, you got two type of guys. Some guys will back down and they've just had enough, but they check out. You don't want that. Then you got the other guy that you just do this to him, you drip on him, you drip on him, and he just gets more hard-headed. And that's me. I just dig in deeper and dig in deeper, dig in deeper. She comes at me more and more. I'm dig How many of you know I got a harder head than her? So, And she just finally breaks down. She's so upset, this and this and that. 
And I just dig in deeper. And then, watch this. God says he doesn't answer my prayers. So now I'm in the dark. The guy who's supposed to be leading with no headlights. Because of the situation that we've created. It's only going to hurt both of us. And so I'd get frustrated until one day I, I, I just said, Dad, gummit, won't you let me lead? You know, she's like, but you're not seeing this and this and that. And, and then I go, I'm sorry, I just can't see it. I don't think like, I don't have the discernment you have. And then it was like. That's not my spiritual gift. So I, now we've learned, say, okay, God, you put us together for a reason. She's a discerner. So people come up to me with ideas and, oh, pastor, I want to be this for you. I want this. I want that. I want. Let me talk to Pastor Melissa. Drive some of y'all crazy. Because you look at me and you go, I can get over on him, but I can't get over on her. I've had leaders. Go, I don't want to talk to Pastor Melissa. I wonder why. <laughs> Because she can read right through you. She can read your mail. That's how she is. So now I bring everybody to Pastor Melissa. Go, hey, what do you think? Mm -mm. This person's not for you. This is not going to work out. This is not. But the things I'm good at, now she trusts me and lets me do. And this is important because I was outside frustrated as can be. Frustrated as can be. We were fighting and fighting and fighting. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I need you to answer me. I've got, I'm going to stay out here. I, I put down my, my bed in my truck and I laid down. And I said, I'm going to be here all night. All night if it has to. And he goes, how long you got? Because I'm infinite. And I said, okay, God, please, would you answer me? He said, you go inside and treat your wife right and I'll answer you. He, he spoke Peter to me. That's what he says. So you guys got to work this out. Ladies, you have to work with your husbands. Husbands, you've got to work with them. But you've got to let him lead at the same time. You've got to let her help you lead. It's a, it's a, no, it's that's a, a good point. Thing. Because I think lots of times we come home and after nights like tonight, we're like, yes, we feel convicted. And the minute that our husbands try to love us the way that Christ wants them to love us, then we start with our whole, like, well, let me tell you what I think now. Because, you know, we feel a little bit more empowered that the enemy causes us to feel that way. So you really have to be careful. Like, if your husband's trying or your wife's trying, be appreciative. If you show good faith, like, man, I know we're not, we're not where we're supposed to be yet. Like, today we were fighting. No, we're not today. <laughs> But I, you, don't, I didn't even know we were. So you made it sound, now, now you made it sound like it was today. It wasn't today. But, um, but, you know, if your spouse is making that effort, then be gracious and love them back. And the pastor talks about that all the time, that downward spiral that, you know, we can we're so different, though? I mean, I mean. Absolutely. I mean, we're different. And, and once you understand our strengths and your weaknesses. But I think there's got to be a point in time when you got to really understand your wife. And you got to really, because somebody's got to be humble. You said that in sermons. We've got to humble ourselves. And that's hard. Like, you, you said it, not me. It's hard. I've known you, I've known you since you were 9, 10, and you, you haven't changed a whole lot, right? <laughs> changed a whole lot. <laughs> you got, you got you strong too. character. <laughs> but you know, right, Pastor, awesome. it, it's, it's important that I think that you just got to really just learn to give it up as a man. I mean, quit and just love on her. I mean, look, look at the beauty that God created. And guys going to see that. I mean, there's, I saw my wife, and I hunted her down like a, a, when we, Grandpa used to take us coon hunting, man. Coon hunting. <laughs> I mean, he pursued. And when you pursue her, it's because you see something in her that's so beautiful. That's you know? awesome. And we got to do that. I think we got to be in love again. And some of us, what does it say? I was reading it. Revelation 3, in the church of Ephesus, it says, you've lost your first love. You've lost that love and that feeling. That love and feeling. Mm -hmm. Go back to where you first were, the very first time you saw her. There's nothing like it. And I always relive that moment. I tell her that. I, I want to get into something that's really going to bring this, bring this down. And uh, it's the last verse of Ephesians 5. The last two verses of, three verses of Ephesians 5. Can someone read that for me? Brady, you read it. Read Ephesians. 
It's not on there. You got to get in your Bible. There's some things. I couldn't put it all on two pages. I'm still just impressed that Gil talked about his wife and coon hunting and then somehow survived the sentence. I know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm proud of you. I'm, so I'm not talking much tonight. I'm impressed. Yeah, Melissa, you can read it. Brady, Brady ain't nowhere near. <laughs> Go ahead. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as there is also one hope that belongs to the calling you received. No, five. You're in four. You, chapter you said four or five. I'm sorry. Chapter five, verse 30. Oh, 31. 31. Nevertheless, say it right, nevertheless, my is that what the one, Pastor? Was it the last verse? For this yeah, nevertheless. Reason. For this reason. That one. For this reason, a, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. So, real flesh. quick, see if you're listening. Paul is quoting out of where? No, he's not quoting out of Ephesians. We're reading out of Ephesians. He's quoting out of where? Genesis. Thank you. He, we just read this. Genesis, remember? You shall leave your father and your mother. Keep going. Um, the, this the two are united in one. This is a great... Keep going. It's profound. This mystery is very great, but I speak concerning the revelation of Christ in the church. However, let each man of you, without exception, love his wife as being in the sense his very own self, and let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. She notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves and admires him exceedingly. This is important. This Mine is very, very important. Just respect. She's got the amplified. I, I wanted to go deep into that, Brady. <laughs> She's got the amplified version. And how many of you know sometimes you got to go beyond just the normal version you're used to reading? Because sometimes you got to read different words and you go, oh, okay. I've just thought respect was just like, okay, don't mistreat him. But no, I mean, it goes into all of these things. And so we put this little box right here in the middle of your notes. Mm -hmm. You're called to be a helper. Mm -hmm. You're called to understand the authority of God and how he sets up order. Because God is a God of? God is a God of? Order. order. What is disorder? It's called chaos. It's called anarchy. It's called rebellion. Rebellion is witchcraft before the Lord. He has nothing to do with that. Everything is by his order, okay? Now watch. Ladies, this is important, not just for ladies, for anybody understanding authority. When you are under authority, you have to honor that authority. You also have to be obedient to that authority except for what? You got one exception for obedience. You have no exception for honor. Did you know that? The Bible gives you no wiggle room for not honoring authority. It gives you wiggle room, one, one exception for disobedience. And what is that? Obey God. He's the ultimate authority. So if your husband asks you to do something that is against God's law, you have permission to ignore it. Husband says, answer that phone and tell him I'm not here. You can say, sweetheart, I won't lie for you. I'll tell him you have no desire to talk to them because they've gotten on your last nerves or whatever else you want me to tell them. <laughs> but I won't lie for you. Amen? Well, I want you to watch this pornography with me and I am the head of the household. Sweetheart, I won't do it because it's dishonoring to our king and our God. Whatever it is that your husband asks, if it's outside of God's law, you can say no. But you still say, sweetheart, you still treat him with honor. Every example you see in the Old Testament, I want you to, show, I want you to notice something. King Nebuchadnezzar put an evil law up. That evil law was, at the sound of music, everyone will bow to the golden image that I created. The three Jewish boys said, your honor, 
Your majesty, our Lord, we will not disobey our God. We will not disobey. Showed him honor because of his authority, but did not obey. So there's a difference here that I want us to get that because here we're talking about respect is honor. Respect is honor. I want the ladies to talk about respect because I think where I see a lot of it go wrong and we miss the blessing of the Lord is when we don't respect our husbands. I know I set y'all up there for... Well, um, you know, I think that it sets a tone in the home when the mom doesn't respect her husband, because if, if we as our, you know, as wives don't respect our husbands, our children aren't going to respect, um, Mm. their father and it's going to be passed down. And so I think it's very important to remember how we treat one another because there are little eyes that are always watching us. And the very thing that they see us doing is the very thing that they will easily carry into their home. It doesn't mean that God can't change that, but it's going to be really difficult because they've already seen that pattern established within their home. And so I think that it, there's a weight that's lifted off of us when we are able to trust our husbands and obey them. Um, it takes that pressure off. You see, God never intended us as women to carry some of the loads that we try to take on and carry ourselves. Men are different. They think differently. They've got those compartments that we've talked about uh, where we will stay up all night thinking about something. They can take it to the Lord, put it in his hands, and trust that he's able to do it. We're thinking about how are we going to fix it? What can we do to improve it? We'll be up all night. But really when we say, here, I trust you, God's going to give you the direction for our family. And our kids see us as moms trusting our husbands as well. And they know and they can rest too and say, man, dad's got this. Just like we should be able to trust our heavenly father, right? And saying, man, dad, you've got this. Mm. And so that's a real life example that they can see within their home and seeing the way that authority works. Just as Jesus trusted the father, we should be able to trust our husbands and our children should be able to trust their fathers. Amen. Wow. I love that. I love, I love what being in a relationship with Christ has done in our home. But I especially love when, when I got right. I mean, y'all, y'all heard the verse. Um, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You know, one of the greatest strengths that I feel I have is my mouth, but it's also one of my greatest weaknesses as well because um, I use it. Rick is smiling yeah. big. <laughs> <laughs> but when I learn to use it as God has designed it to be used in respect and honor him, I have just seen my husband grow into the man that I've always believed he would be. I mean, me and Rick were just, sorry parents, I, we just liked each other. Like, I just, we just loved each other and we were all wrong in all kinds of ways and nobody thought we should be together and we were just crazy about each other. But we had it all wrong. So it took a long time for us to get it right. But I, I loved when I started honoring him, respecting him, building him up. And you know, we, we kind of joke, and what I tried to do to Rick, you can see what Lacey has done in a short period of time, because uh, Brady doesn't work out. This is just like, this is just Brady because Lacey's built him up. You know, this is just <laughs> not it. natural. Like, you know, we know what Brady looked like before he got married. This is just, you know, just peacocks, you know. Little peacocks. And Russell said, you go to the gym, but you never lift. You yeah. just talk. He talks yeah, yeah. my face off. <laughs> you just talk. <laughs> This is what your man will look like, you know, when you build him up. But I feel that's what we can do with our mouth, you know. We can, we can bring him down and we can use our, our mouth so um, violently and bring, but there's power of life and death in our tongue. And so I love that as I began to respect Rick and that as he's begun to thrive and I can just encourage him with my words that I love the man that he's become in, in, in our relationship. So he's getting bigger as, he, as we're sitting there, but you know. <laughs> Pastor. I also think it doesn't mean that men are, men are superior. It doesn't mean that we're superior because no. the scripture tells us, you know, God Father, God Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're co-equal. Christ is co-equal with God the Father in the head and the Holy Spirit. So actually we're, we're equal in, in the sense. But there's the authority and order there's even authority. in the Godhead is what you're saying. Because he always refers Christ as, uh, to the Father. You know, when it's all over, said and done, he'll turn it over to the Father when that day comes. 11.3 also, says it right there, right? That Christ is, God is head of Christ. And, and, yes. and Christ said, I didn't do anything unless, what? 
Father. The Father so, directed it. The Holy Spirit, the, uh, Christ says, the Holy Spirit will come and only take what is from me and make it known to you. So there's an order. Um, there one, should be order in the home. One last thing I want to talk about here, and in, in the version I have, it talks about the wife and she, that she sees him and she respects him and reverences him and that she notices him, regards him, and honors him and prefers him. And to me, I think that we miss this a lot when we get married, and especially moms who have young kids. And, and it really doesn't matter what age the kid is. You can you you start this like as soon as that kid is born, all of a sudden the person like Christy says, "Man, I loved Rick. I just loved him. I love Pastor. I mean, I was like, I, I, I saw him when I was a little girl, and I was like, I want to marry him. That's the guy I have. But you know, it could have easily changed when Raquel came into our lives because that's what happens sometimes. The kid comes in and and all of a sudden, well, we forget about dad and we start putting all our focus as women on our children and we put them first and we watch over them. Well, they're just little. They just need to be cared for and loved and they need to be birthed and changed. But then they get older when you start getting involved in what they're doing. And slowly the husband starts to fade further and further and further in the backdrop. And you always have to remember, put your husband first in your home. God first and then the Amen. second. Okay? So, you know, don't have your kids in, in, you know, the privacy of your bedroom all the time. Okay? It's time to go to bed so that mom and dad can have some time. And I think that that's important if you want to cultivate love and if you want to cultivate um, you know, closeness. the closeness that you need to make sure you Pastor, can I read spend time with your husband. Yes, says, come on. That's uh, very this good. This is a real short Pastor one. And, and men should repeat like this that. and women. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes, your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Gilead. <laughs> now, that has some true meaning. I mean, you got to really understand the Song of Solomon, how romantic it actually was. I like was. when he says your teeth are like freshly shorn. Yes. She, not yes. a one of them is missing. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uh, that, she had a high standard. Quote, unquote. <laughs> she has all her teeth, you know. But, you know See what that does. Yes, it's very important. <laughs> I do know I want to share just one thing because what Pastor Melissa was saying is so important. And I remember being in one of the hardest seasons of my life. And it was right in the, right in the season when God was changing everything in our home. And we were struggling so bad because our children... One was in Houston, and I was in the hospital with Nikki in Houston, and Rick was caring for Luke, and it was just chaos in the way you would look at things. But Rick would come during the weeknight just to see me and Nikki in Houston, and it was so tough. And I remember looking at him, and the kids, and Nikki's in the bed, and Luke's little, and it was just, you know, just a mess. And I had to look at Rick, and, I, and it was just so, I was so thankful that the Lord reminded me, like, you need to kiss him. And I thought, really? Like, but I, I, he, rem he helps you, doesn't he? Isn't he the helper? And the Holy Spirit helped me. And I was like, hey, you want to go into the bathroom here? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah. You're at MD I, Anderson. I got, you know, You're at MD Anderson. We're, yes, we're at MD Anderson. We're in Houston. And I'll never forget. I was like, I better do that because he was alone. He was alone. He was coming back and forth. I didn't need to go in the bathroom, but I knew he needed to be reminded of, of the, and I know that women, I don't like to bring it up, but we have to be reminded that our men have our physical beings and they need sex and they need love. And That's what need, Gil keeps reminding. He's reading Song of Solomon. <laughs> My I brother keeps it saying. Different. <laughs> I went old school, she went new school. She did, she went, well, well, she went old not, school. I mean, not that that was, but just, you have to, that they're different kind of beings. And so in that moment that everything was a mess and I had to, but the Lord allowed me that moment to fixate on him. And I was so happy to see him, but I had to just go. I know this is awkward and it's sterile and everything's right in the bathroom, but not that that was what we were doing, but just to, to say, I just need, just to touch you. I think Watch you're already going too far. Hey. <laughs> we're back to, we're going back to coon hunting. Said too much. Back to no, we're going back to coon hunting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're sitting next to your father. <laughs> yeah, you're sitting next to your father. <laughs> Did not oh, happen in the bathroom, goodness. but just what I'm but trying I to think, say, you know, to help Yeah, me, and help I think, me, and I me. think that's a really good point help me. because anytime, anytime we take our spouse for granted, ladies, anytime we take our spouse for granted, 
the enemy is more than happy to bring somebody along who will not take him for granted. And trust me, he's going to bring somebody along that just he knows will take notice of your husband. Okay, so in all seriousness, what Christy's talking about is even in the challenging times, that's where you really have to, going back to that first verse we read, really have to leave and cleave. Cleave to one another. In the most difficult times, cleave to one another. So many times we see couples in those difficult times turn away from one another and you get upset with one another. But what her and Rick, what she shared from her heart is that in that tough moment where they could have just been focused on so many other things because there were so many other things for them to focus on, y'all spent time focusing on was of utmost importance, which was your relationship because together you can get through anything, right, with Jesus Christ. So. Amen. I think I think I want to make note of that. I think last week Brady shared that. He shared that very same thing. We can get through anything, anything. I was. If I know. I was sick, and I heard you were talking about how I was sick. Is that when I was sick, and you were telling people yes, I was throwing yes. up? I, I think. But you, I thank also you for that complimented love. you, love. I said that that you know my my wife. I mean, honestly, if she's behind me, I can do anything. I, I can do anything. And, and I think that's the way the Lord meant it. Yeah. They, but ladies, don't miss that. Because you can either make your husband great or you can tear him down. We just saw the movie... Um, the Darkest Hour. Darkest Hour. And the one thing we noticed was um, Winston Churchill's wife. He was grumpy and didn't believe in himself and all she kept doing, she wouldn't listen to any of his complaining. She'd say, you're great, you're wonderful. Get out there and just build him up. Boy, he'd go out there and take on the world. It was awesome. What if she would, oh yeah, you're nothing, you're this, you're that. You're, I mean, he wouldn't have done any of what he did. And so I, I see that so much in the home. I can't tell you how many times I hear ladies put down their husbands or talk negatively about them or act like they're no big deal or there's nothing special or no that's the worst thing you can do the bible says respect honor build him up admire him you know there's a little song that goes oh i think that i found myself a cheerleader I knew God knew you. you know <laughs> i like music you notice i listen to all kinds of music yeah. but it me think about that your husband needs you to be his biggest cheerleader. And that's the way we were meant to work. When you're his biggest cheerleader and he feels that, then guys, then you turn around and you love her the way Christ loves the church. And, you, and notice there's a difference. Wives will say this to me when we get in counseling. Melissa and I, they'll, they'll say it to both of us because I don't counsel by myself. I counsel with my wife. They come in and they say, but I love him. He's not receiving that love if you don't respect him. <clears throat> Guys receive it with respect. Notice the Bible says, don't love your husband. It doesn't say anything about loving him. You want to show him love? Respect him. Admire him. Build him up. Uh, what is it? Honor him. Notice honor. Wives... Or husbands, notice, it doesn't say respect your wives. It says love her. Be caring. Be patient. Be kind. Value her. Listen to her. This has been something that's taken us a very, very, very long time. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that I saw my father and mother's relationship go downhill. And it was... Her disrespecting my dad, my dad, did, and, and so I remember thinking, no one's ever going to disrespect me. And it was all about respect. And when Melissa started realizing, hey, all I have to do is make sure he feels respected, and man, that dude will start soaring. <laughs> all of a sudden, I started soaring, but the minute she started nagging me, and that's why I put it in there. I'll put it in there. Why so many exclamation marks? I think we get the point. <laughs> the minute you start getting on your husband, getting, getting on, he's either going to check out 
or if he'll dig in and say, come on, let's fight. None of them are good. Neither is good. Read the Bible there. What does the Bible say about this? Guys, y'all might want to highlight these. He said, and for our, what, what I love is that this is Solomon, you know, and he keeps saying it. If you, I pulled up all these verses and he like says the same thing like three or four times over, over, and, over and over again. It's the same thing. He says, uh, Proverbs 19, 13, a quarrelsome wife is like the constant dripping of a leaky roof, right? He says, better is it to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. You're, you're using the word quarrelsome. I like I like the, the modern version. Because people go, well, what is quarrelsome? Quarrelsome me. I... Nagging. Nagging. Come on, let's just get to it. Look, last week, y'all didn't have a single problem me getting on the guys. Well, guess what? The guys said, finally, Pastor, finally. I've been coming here for five years. Not once have you addressed the women. Well, here we go. Here we go. Come on. Josh is the only one clapping. <laughs> here we go. Read, read, them, read them right here. We, we'll share it. We're fighting over Proverbs 21.9. Better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a nagging wife. Better. Proverbs 21.19. Better to live in a wilderness than with a nagging and hot-tempered wife. Wilderness. What does the wilderness mean? Somewhere that there's no way to see. <laughs> or heater. Proverbs 27, 15 through 17. A nagging wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Stopping her is like trying to stop the wind. It's like trying to grab olive oil with your hand. <laughs> Did you notice I didn't write any of this? This was written by God's holy prophets. What do you think, guys, the Bible is trying to get across to us here? Well, today Remember, there's two ways of doing things. There's the world's way, and then there's God's way. What is God trying to get across to us here? I think you, we talked about it earlier, uh, the order in which he brought men and women together. And I've learned the hard way that I tell my wife every day how beautiful she is. I do, and I, sweetheart, you're beautiful. I, 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 I enrich her, I, I say good things, Amen. you know? And I think that's something that we have to learn. And, and I think also we gotta realize that we as men, you always say we're the leaders, but if you're gonna be a general, a field general, you better know what the heck you're doing or talking about. You better also share with her the word of God Take Amen. a few minutes every morning before y'all go. My wife and I, we get up at, you know, So you're saying read these verses to her? Yeah, well, not those. I want to hear, I want to hear about well, these verses. I go back to Song me, of Songs. Gil, Gil I, goes right I back. I love Gil. Gil's, goes, Gil's old school. I'm going to hit on the guys. I'm going to hit on the guys. I'm going to hit on, nah, we, we, we got to bring it back. I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about what, what it's saying. I love that about the guys, but... Tonight, I, I get the sense that pastors really want us to talk about this. And I think if you think about what our number one role is, is to be our husband's helpmate, right? Yeah. Ladies, yes? yes? Can we all agree on that? Yes, amen. Okay. So when we start nagging about our husbands, uh, when we start talking about it or complaining to him, or I call it my cousin girl, you won't believe what my husband did to me today, <laughs> uh, and start, start complaining about him, what I really am doing is... Um, I need to wake up and realize that God sent me to help him. So there's no doubt that our husbands do need help because God created us to help them. But the problem is we don't need to be complaining or nagging about them. We need to get in our role and start helping them and assisting them. So instead of saying, well, it's his fault, his fault, his fault, we need to look in the mirror and say, well, what am I doing to help the situation out? Mm. So truly and honestly, part of the, you know, when, we, when we're arguing about our husband and he'll never get it right, well, he'll never be the you know what he needs to be and why can't he be more like this and why can't well you know what why can't he because we're not fulfilling our role the way God wanted us to so we've got to recognize that it is up to us to build him up just like you know it's our role as parents to raise our kids as That's right our wives. it's not just my role to to remodel our house oh my goodness y'all <laughs> y'all don't get me started 
Don't get me started. <laughs> so better. Pastor, so Proverbs 27, 15 through 16, a nagging wife is like a dripping, dripping of a leaky roof on a rainstorm. Stopping her is like trying to stop the wind. It's like trying to grab olive oil with your hand. Ha, ha, ha. What's the very next verse in the God-inspired wisdom that Solomon wrote down for us? One with many wives. 27, 17. Amen. Iron sharpens iron. I like to take these verses and look at the context and read verses around them because life verses with context are more powerful. Right after nagging, sharpen iron. That's what we're talking about tonight. Being yes. a helpmate. Let me tell you the life-changing positivity of my wife. It's, it's never been hard for me to be encouraging and, and point out negativity, but to have her come into my life and start to point it out, it's, it's really humbling. It affects everything. Our words matter. You heard me talk about my son and just call him a knucklehead, not out of a bad place, but our words matter. And tell him who he is and prophesy over him who he is. You're kind. Be kind today. Show that. You're the light of Christ. Show that today. It's very different. But in social circumstances, in family circumstances, she's helped me be a better protector of my home and my kids just by helping me and opening my eyes to see how important, incredibly important our words are. When, when, I go, when I go home with her to California to her house, you walk in and the love is overwhelming. It's very different. It's very different than, I love my parents to death, I love my family, but if they're not all aware of how much our words matter, it changes the environment. So my home now, we speak against that negativity when the kids say something. She checks me when I start to say something in a, in a way that I hear it and it's easy to receive with Amen. a soft touch. Baby, honor is so powerful. I talked about it last week. Who's the best first lady? Nancy Reagan, why, what did she do? I don't know, but look at Ronald Reagan. He did a great job. Amen. Brady, thank you. Thank you, panel. Come on. I want to sum it up for you and just, guys, if you felt me pushing, I was. Because I think too many times we succumb to society saying sugarcoat it, sugarcoat it, sugarcoat it. So last week I pushed them, what? Tell the guys what they need to hear by God's word. Don't coddle the men. Tell them what it is to be a man. This, this week I said, what? Tell the ladies what they need to hear. I want to share with you, my wife is not a perfect woman. But the one thing she does consistently is build me up in the home. She builds me up. She builds me up. Builds me up. And, and for that, it feels, feels awesome feels great. I know people have been coming up and encouraging me and saying, man, don't worry. And I didn't mean it like that when I said that on Sunday. I was just meaning that the, that the Holy Spirit was working on me and I tend to get a little funky. And, but really, people are like, man, don't feel bad. I don't feel bad. You know why I don't feel bad? I'm not saying that to be mean or to be cocky. I don't feel bad because my wife comes over and says, man, high five, way to go, absolutely great job. She's building me up. That's what we're called to do for one another. That's what we're called to do for one another. That's what Brady meant, iron sharpens iron. Don't tear each other down. Wives, be the biggest support champion of your husbands. I love you with all my heart. And that's why I push so hard to preach the truth. Not the way society wants it done the way God's word was written. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a blessing over every marriage. I pray that every lady and wife and mother would realize how special their role is. How, Lord, they are all a type of Savior, helper, a 
type of Holy Spirit for their husbands. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that right now that you would begin to move in the home like never before. Ordering God your order, putting things in your order, setting up God what you intended as we submit to you as leaders, as we submit to you and your authority, as we submit to your way and say, God, have your way in us and Lord, we want to take your word serious. In Jesus' name, bring the blessing that you, you call for it. Amen.